Comic Fam, thank you so much for joining us today. This is the Bags and Boards Show, episode number 17. I'm actually sitting here remotely with my friend, longtime friend, Bueller, from the amazing YouTube channel, Comics with Bueller. How you doing? I'm doing great, Tom. Thank you so much for having me back on the Comic-Con 101 show. We've known each other for a long time. It's my pleasure to be back once again on the Bags and Boards podcast. We are going to be touching on some touchy subjects. We're talking about controversial stuff. We're actually going to be talking about censorship. We're going to be talking about, I'm going to straight up say it, nudity. We're going to be talking about that on the show today. We found out from Todd McFarlane even more comic books that he's not going to sign. We're going to be jumping into that here pretty soon as well. But before we move on forward, I want to chat with you, Bueller, about something you do every single week that I utilize, and it helps me on my hunt, and I watch this video before I go out to my comic book stores. Well, Tom, you're talking about our weekly preview video that we put out every Wednesday for the new comic books. We cover all the books that are coming out for new comic book day for every Wednesday, every Marvel book, every DC book, image, you name it. We got it on that video. If you're ever wondering what a cover is going to look like, that's the video you want to watch. And I'll tell you this, it's the number one most watched preview video on YouTube. And that's because of our great community that watch it week after week. Bueller does great content for the community every single week. I'm going to put his YouTube link in the description below. Go give him a subscribe. Let's jump into the first topic of the show. Bueller, you were actually instructed by one of the McFarlands. I was, and this is kind of a great story. And actually one I just shared with you not too long ago. So Miss McFarland, Todd's wife, it was actually a school teacher for me in Clackamas High School between the years of 1991 and 1993. She was a science teacher there. That was my high school. She taught me science. I did not do very well in science class. But we found out one really cool thing. And want to know what that is, Tom? What was that? Her husband was Todd McFarland. Oh, my goodness. We were over the moon for Todd McFarland. We were all big fans. And you know what? We were on her on a daily basis asking her, could Todd please come to the school and say hello to his fans? All right. I have to know. At what point did you realize that this was the wife of your favorite comic book artist? I realized because a friend of mine figured it out. I don't know how he did it because her actual mating name was on her placard. But we saw that, we recognized it, and all of a sudden, the door was wide open for us to meet Todd McFarlane. Interesting. So you had requested him come into the school. What happened? He did, and that was awesome. And let me tell you something about Todd McFarlane. This is back in the day, and I don't think you're going to remember this, but we had mullets. They were looking all stylish, and Todd was rocking the mullet from the very first day I saw him. He came to our school. At that time, there wasn't a lot of people my age, I think I was around 14 years old, that were really in the comics. So he gave us private lessons on how to draw Spider-Man. There was like four or five of us in the audience. Wow, what a cool thing. So you were one of just a few people who even cared at that time, and you knew then that you were meeting someone important. At what time of his life, let me... Paint a picture for me here. What was he about to release at that point? Well, Image was right around the corner. He had actually mentioned that at the school. He mentioned that there was a character that he's always wanted to do. Marvel probably wouldn't be the one to put it out. And of course, very soon after, we see Image Comics come, and then we have Spawn. And I'm pretty sure that's the character he was talking about. For 14-year-old kids, seeing their idol. For me, he was an idol. He was my Michael Jordan. Not some actor, not some athlete. This guy was my Michael Jordan, and I got to see him when I was very young. And that impression that he made on me has lasted a lifetime. Can you elaborate on that? Because I think this is a great example of the responsibility that that isn't necessarily on these creators. But when they choose to take on it, then it could really impact their fan base and youth in general. At a 14-year-old age, very impressionable. He noticed that right away. And he took the time to recognize that with us. He didn't have to come to the school. He didn't have to do this for us. He knew there probably wasn't going to be that many people. It was probably the smallest crowd he's ever performed for, to be honest with you. And I got to take advantage of that. Now, an example was he pulls me on stage. I asked him a question, how do you draw Spider-Man? He tells me to draw two lines on a piece of paper. So I do. And he literally draws Spider-Man from those two lines. He fits all the limbs 
in the lines and stuff like that. And that's how Spider-Man was back then. He was all gangly and limbs were going everywhere. It was fantastic. It shaped my life because I cemented myself for the joy of comics at that moment right there. And it stayed with me ever since. It's for that reason I wanted to bring this story to the community's attention because there is a lot of fathers and mothers in the community that have children that take them to conventions. And I think this is something, a story that I've heard time and time again, where these creators happen to connect with a member of their family. And they don't realize that it's going to happen, but it does. And even McFarlane has this story that he has shared publicly about Stan Lee of him doing the very similar things, going out of his comfort zone, chatting with the content creator and getting feedback that he didn't have to give. And when Stan did that for McFarlane, it put him on a path to work in comics. And I see this happening all the time in this community. And it's just something I, I like to highlight and, and showcase to the community as much as possible as a reminder, when you go to conventions, these types of opportunities are there if you, you put yourselves in a position to have them happen. It's a great position to be in. and I've actually run into him a couple other times since then. I ran into him about 10 years later. I mentioned the scenario where we were at school and he met me there. He actually referred to me as Wanda's kids. That's his name of his wife. I thought that was great. And then just recently, and this is an unfortunate event, but uh, I had a passing of a friend of mine. He actually sent me a video message sending his condolences about that had happened. And I thought that was really great. And he didn't have to do that. That's awesome. Now, I had heard about this story a couple months ago, and I had asked if you had the yearbook still. Were you able to find that by chance? You got to show me that picture of Mrs. McFarlane. Is it in there? Yep, I got it right here for you, Tom. Check this out right there by my finger. I don't know if you can see it, but there you go. Miss McFarlane and all her black and white glory. There right you go. There. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. We're actually going to touch on some more Todd McFarlane topics here later on on the show. But before we do that, let's chat about the sponsor of the Bags and Boards podcast. That's Key Collector Comics, the best comic book app for collecting in the world. I agree, Tom. I use it on a daily basis. I've actually talked to Nick. You've talked to Nick. He's the creator of the Key Collector comic book app, and he provided a service for comic collectors. And there's not a day that goes by that I literally don't look at that thing. And every time I walk <laughs> into a comic book shop, it's in my hand. There's countless things on the Key Collector app that you can use all the time. You know what? If you use code Tom 101, you get a free week subscription. And let's chat about one of my favorite categories on the app. That is the keys of the week category. The keys of the week is a great category because I focus a lot on new comics. And keys of the week is a new comics category for the app. I look at it all the time because I'm always putting together videos for the books that are coming out. And I actually do a top 10 new release video. And guess what I'm looking at when I'm putting together that video? I'm looking at the Key Collector app to see what it has to say. I use that information with my information and I put together that video and it's one of my most popular. Keys of the Week gets updated every single week and use that code to enhance your comic book collecting. And let's jump into the next subject of the show. We are talking about censorship. We are talking about comic books that are controversial because of some changes in the YouTube community that are coming. We have various types of threats to monetization and channels that make content that may or may not be child-friendly. And that has spawned this idea of this podcast, like the theme of this podcast, and why I have Bueller, a friend who also has a YouTube channel, on the mic today. So the first subject that I thought would be fun to discuss is nudity in comic books, something more adult. What did you say? I, I'm pretty happy to talk about this, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored <laughs> that when nudity came up, he immediately called me, and that's just fantastic. So let's talk about it. <laughs> All right, Bueller, let's jump into it. Nudity in comics. Well, according to Comic Vine, the definition of nudity as it pertains to you know, when it's part of the comic book medium is the absence of clothing usually employed in fiction for either erotic or comedic situations. Now, something that's really fun about this website is that they actually break down instances of nudity in comics. And there's a hard number that they've calculated. And this is for mainstream comic books, ones that you can get on the shelves and ones that are less independent and more mainstream. We have over 2,600 different occasions of nudity happening in comics. And some of the occasions here are actually listed 
by title. So some of the ones we're chatting about, it's not necessarily full nudity, but it's the absence of clothing. So some of these are for artistic purposes and it's not actually like a full frontal or you're seeing something like genitalia or something like that. But some of them are, as in this case here. So Saga, which is an image comic book written by the brilliant Brian K. Vaughn and drawn by the very talented Fiona Staples, it says here has over 24 occasions of full nudity in the comic series so far. I'm not surprised by that at all. I mean, Saga is one of those books to where there's a lot of nudity and strange nudity. And uh, if you're into that type of thing, I think Saga might be the book for you. In a very artistic and creative way, I might add. And another one here is Why the Last Man? I, I went to a Vertigo title here with 17 occasions of nudity. Last but not least, I wanted to also mention this one, Hellboy the Wild Hunt and Darkness Falls, both having six different occasions of full nudity in the comic. Now, when we have comic books have nudity in them, it's for mature readers, obviously, and it's been happening since the start of comic books. However, sometimes it gets past editors, it gets past publishers, and that's when things start to go haywire in the community as far as the collector's community. There are stories that are so good that just need to be discussed because it's fascinating. And Bueller, we should probably start them off with Tony Stark in Avengers Illuminati issue number one. That's right. Tony Stark is nude in Avengers Illuminati number one. There is a great big huge fight scene between Tony Stark and the Scrolls, and Tony doesn't have the time to put on his armor. Not only is he nude, but they strategically take the shadows and placements of other characters so you don't see anything, but he is definitely nude. And at the end of the fight scene, he is standing on top of a mountain and he is more proud than he's ever been and he's on full display. It's classic and it's actually listed on a number of sites as one of the top 10 best nude fight scenes in comic books. Now, let's move on to one that's a little bit more scandalous. We're talking Green Arrow and Black Canary in Green Arrow, issue number 34. This is from 1990, Bueller. Like I said, they didn't hold anything back. And there is a big, huge splash page with multiple panels on the splash page. And many different scenes have nudity in them, not just minor nudity we're talking about full backside and there is a and i'm just gonna say it a nip slip in this book that's right it got past the editors and this is something that this book is known for and one that actually brought some attention to mainstream press when it happened now let's move on to one of the strangest depictions of sexual activity in comic books i have ever seen and bueller <laughs> You have never heard of this until I sent this uh, this picture of the book to you. No, I've never heard of this, and honestly, it made me cry because okay. it's just uh, it's one of those things. It's a doozy comic, fam. It's one that's known in the comic book community, but it's one that we don't like to talk about, but it happened. We're talking about World's Finest, issue number 289. Batman and Superman. Oh, gosh, this is a tough one. It's a tough one. Batman and Superman, okay, they're weeping. They're weeping and they're crying as they are watching a mating ritual between these leech tentacle species that live within the fortress of solitude. They're called the krill. And this tentacle species has to mate by going into each other. And it is the grossest looking thing. And Batman and, and Superman, they're crying because they know that they're going to perish after they experience the emotion and mate they perish after the fact, and it brings them to tears. This is one of the strangest depictions of coitus in comics I've ever seen. Coitus in comics, and I gotta tell you, just look at the panels. I mean, like you said, it's nothing like you've seen before. And although the same mating ritual is done with humans, as far as what you described, <laughs> this is not very pleasant to look at. And like I said before, it brings me to tears, just like it did Batman and Superman. Okay, let's chat about the Electra recall. We're going to get into some recalled comics later on in the discussion, but I think the Electra one is a special one because it actually has a label of the nude edition on CGC labels, does it not? Yeah, it does. It's right on the CGC. It says nude edition on there. This comic is actually pretty widely available. There's a lot of copies of this book. The nudity happens on pages 17 and 18, and it features Electra, obviously. We're talking about the Marvel Knights, Electra from volume two, issue number three. And if you look at page 17 and 18, you will see in the recalled editions, a nude Electra. 
Now, they ended up reprinting this with the same cover, but they added underwear to her body. Now, it's estimated that there's a low 5,000 of these comic books that actually hit the stands, and a little over 400 of which have actually hit the CGC census. But there are a low 500 comic books that were done through like dynamic forces. Are you familiar with these variants, Bueller? I am a little bit. I actually have a few dynamic forces in my collection. I do not have this book, but I want to pick one up because it sounds interesting. And honestly, who wouldn't like to have Electra, a nude version of that book? Yeah, I'll it's, take one. it's a little different. And the dynamic forces were signed by Greg Horn and they were released with the first batch. So likely that most, if not all, were all sent out with the nude panels. Now, let's move on to one of my favorite comic books to have nudity inside of it because of something that happened in 2010. It's funny. It's it, 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 in a way, in a way it's not okay, but just the, the quotes here are, they made me chuckle because we're talking about the specter. We're talking about the specter and unfortunately it nudity crept its way into that book. And it's a, such a great story. And we've read about this. We talked about it before. And I got to tell you, I'm a parent. And this was actually kind of discovered by a child found this nudity. And I can't think of another time when this was brought up. We're talking about Spectre issue number nine from back in 1987. Now, I know this to be obviously from a classic run, but I own multiple copies of this, not because of the nude panel, but because this is a Mignola cover. He actually did a couple of these covers in this run. And being a Mignola enthusiast, I had a bunch of copies. But what I didn't know that is back in 2010, a Utah boy was purchased a stack of books that came from the Dollar Tree. And in this stack of books was this Spectre issue number nine. Yeah, a Utah mother bought these books for her son at a Dollar Tree of all places, gave them to her son. He went home, started flipping through these books. On the very first page of Spectre number nine, there it was, nudity in the comic book. The kid felt a little uncomfortable, but he did the right thing, and he went and told an adult right away, and I actually have a quote from what he said. That's right. Bleeding Cool reported on this back in 2010. What did this mother say? Well, the mother herself didn't feel comfortable at all. She actually said it really embarrassed me because I had given a 10-year-old boy this book. I seen the naked lady and I got mad. <laughs> 10-year-old Sheldon Conley, loves, who loves comic books but knew something was wrong when he opened The Spectre, he says, I just turned the page and I seen the naked ladies, so I handed it to a grown-up and said, hey, look at this. <laughs> So fortunately, Sheldon was able to put this comic away and give it back to his mother and, you know, can, can grow up without, you know, the specter messing up his youth. He can save it for maybe later on in his life. But it's instances like this that we're trying to prevent, right? Not all comic books are for kids. And I think that's a big part of this conversation, isn't it? It is. And, you know, as a parent myself, my kids are older now, but at that age when they were 10 or 11 or nine years old, that's what we do. We're in protection mode. We're trying to protect our kids from stuff like this, nudity, or maybe stuff they're not prepared to see. This kid actually did the right thing. The mother kind of did the wrong thing. But you know what? It all worked out at the end, and we got a great story to talk about. Exactly, Bueller. And it's these types of instances that we're trying to avoid. But I thought that's a good example about how comic books and kids don't always go together and this is a common misconception that since the early 70s we've been trying to fight it is it's something that's now coming to light because of this COPPA thing and you know what it does have a lot of people scared but i think there is a lot of fear out there we're going to kind of get into that as we talk about this subject but it does make you wonder because the characters that we talk about are considered to be kid friendly i guess you'd say and what are comics Comics might just be kid-friendly as well. Exactly, Bueller. And it's for those reasons why I felt it fitting to talk about this subject today. We have COPA, or COPA, however you like to pronounce it. It's an acronym, and it stands for Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Now, this is a law put in place to protect children and the type of information that is gathered by them. And why this pertains to us in the YouTube community right now is because YouTube has just been hit with a huge fine and have rolled out 
a bunch of different requirements now put onto YouTube content creators that across the board appears to be a threat to anyone who makes content that may be enjoyed by children. It is a hard subject to talk about because we're, we're constantly sitting here asking ourselves, is my content kids friendly? I, on the hand, would say it's not uh, made for kids. Is it friendly to kids? Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's made for kids. And that's where the gray area is right now when it comes to this COPPA thing. The gray area was where pretty much almost all people are kind of falling into, and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next. So the concern here is this law. It actually was enacted back in 2000 in April, and this was at the start of internet becoming a very household thing. The law was put in place to protect individuals who are under the age of 13 of having businesses collect their information. Now, first things first, we're not lawyers, so there that needs to be said. But if you go through, you can watch a 45-minute press conference that has been aired over this last week, um, or you can take a look at the FTC complaint doc or the stipulated order that was submitted to YouTube for this whole rollout of the complaints that they had and that what resulted into the filing of a $170 million lawsuit. COPPA has made it so that if a channel is being monetized on YouTube, is making content for children, then those channels are at risk of not only being shut down, but being fined so heavily that they may exceed $40,000 per video. That's right. That is uh, the fine that they're looking at. Now, just so everyone knows, it's not an automatic fine. This is not something that you would just get a bill for and you have to pay. There is a process that our government has. You would actually go to court. You would have to have a lawyer and all that stuff. Like Tom said, we are not lawyers. So our advice is just our personal opinions. But this is something that is getting a lot of attention right now. And it does have us worried. Now, like I said before, I don't consider my content to be kids content. What about you, Tom? I don't either. And although it is on the side of kid friendly because we avoid the use of foul language and really diving into subjects that are you know, too controversial that would be potentially flagged or not marketing friendly. Our analytics show that as little as 0.01% of our audience is of the age of 13. Yeah, it's very small. My algorithm shows the same thing. I look at my numbers. Everything is really above in their 20s. There are people my age. There are people your age who are collecting comics. And our content is focused on the collector. There's not a lot of 13-year-old kids or younger that are collecting comics. And the stuff that we talk about, that's what we focus on. We've had a handful of DMs come through, emails written to the show, comments on multiple videos asking us to address our feelings of these changes coming to YouTube in as little as two weeks. I mean, by the time you're watching this video, it's going to be less than that. And at this point, we don't know what's going to happen. And the kind of like title of this video is like, is the channel ending? Could it potentially be the end of other comic channels that you like? Is that a hyperbole? In my opinion, I don't think it's what's going to happen, but it's not hyperbole. These are real things that could happen because what would actually signify the death of a channel that is community driven is the lack of community. And it's not just demonetization that we're fearing. It is the multiple layers of restrictions that become in place if a channel is looked at as being as content that's being made for kids, even if it's not on the surface, like maybe a comic book collecting channel goes. If that is the case, it's not just demonetization. We lose comment sections. We lose notifications. We lose access to being put into playlists. It's the death of the community. So a community channel that loses a community, in a way, yes, it could be the death of many channels that we hold dear. I agree. You said it exactly right. It literally is the death of the community, not the channel. The channel is there, but the community won't be able to find the channel. And the interaction that we have with our audience on a daily basis is gone. And to be totally honest, if that was gone, would I be driven to make the videos that I make? Would you be driven to make the videos you make? Probably not, because I met you because of this channel. You've met people because of your channel. I've made great 
relationships with people and I don't want that at the end. Same here. And one thing that I found interesting is that when I went through the complaint document that the FTC filed, they actually had a handful, over 10 different sightings that they were claiming were channels that were marketing to children. And these are very large channels. Like we're talking giant YouTube channels. We are very, very small in this community here. But compared to like Hasbro, which was listed on this document, the big thing here is that they were self-declarating that they were making content for children. They would say that these are kids unboxings. They would say that these videos are made for kids. And that's actually part of the FTC recommendation is making a declaration that your content isn't for children because the requirement that YouTube place to be 13 years of age or older has all been thrown out the window after going on record and providing proof that they've been collecting information for individuals of all ages for quite some time. I do not think it's right that if I make a piece of content that is decent and being able to be watched by everybody, I don't think that's the content that should be fined. And literally, that's kind of what they're doing right here. That's mysterious. That's strange to me. I would look at content that's being made that's not decent, and then the kids watch that. I would think that that's the stuff that would be flagged. Right now, it's on the other end of the stick. And it's like, literally, if you make decent content that revolves around characters that we talk about, there's a possibility that we fall in that category. We're going to have to wait and see, but you mentioned something that I thought important, which is that you're going to start to have to structure your content around the potential that it could be maybe mistaken as kid centric. And what I mean by that is, all right, well, you know, I wanted to make a video that may inform parents on different kids comics that they may be into. I mean, I have itty bitty Hellboy on my main studio set in every single video that I recommend to every person who watches our channel. But now those videos may actually cause or pose a problem and could be the destruction of a channel. It takes one video that could hit the FTC's radar that could cause a fine that would make it just something that we wouldn't want to even risk. So why do it in the first place? Absolutely. You know, the, the future is definitely in question. But you know what? Uh, I like to think positive, and honestly, I think we're going to be okay, and I'm going to keep my fingers crossed, and nothing's going to stop. I think we're both going to keep making our videos until they tell us not to, and hopefully that day doesn't come. Comic fan, we want to hear your thoughts on this because this is a very real thing that's happening in the next month and it's going to pose a threat to a lot of channels and we're going to wait and see and keep you updated all along the way. But supporting our channel has never been more important and you can do that by liking, by commenting, just by engaging. It keeps the channel alive. Those little things really go a long way and we need your support now more than ever. I'm really looking forward to reading some of the comments that you guys are going to leave because this is a great subject and really it's about censorship. And there's a lot of censorship that might be coming our way, so we have to be aware. Now, we're talking about that, and we have a very special guest joining us on the channel. Tom, you got a great one. What do you have? We're talking about Brian Polito. He's a regular guest on this podcast, I'm proud to say. And Brian, aside from being, you know, the owner of Coffin Comics, creator of Lady Death and Evil Ernie, he has a career making mature comics horror comics and i wanted to chat with him about his experience with censorship and mature comic book creating he's had a lot of success in the last 25 years excited to hear what he has to say comic tom how you doing dude i'm doing so good man we're talking about a sensitive subject on today's show and i thought there's no better person to have <laughs> than the master of mature comics um i wanted to read you something brian this is Later. uh 1998 the preview tour <laughs> of supernaturals that was fun great great time so much fun to do so in yeah, your intro time, you said something that got me thinking this week and i thought it just was fitting on this topic of censorship we make comics for people who don't normally read comics that's always part of our game the comic industry is a pond we're out to cause a ripple and turn the comic industry into an ocean so <laughs> you had been in the game for what five years at that time that's right yeah, okay. I was like, I was young and filled with piss and vinegar and out to shake it up. And you know what? I think we did. <laughs> you did. Well, at that time, you had won numerous awards. And would you not be offered a job at Marvel like soon after this? It's true. Uh, it is a little known arcane 
topic, but during that time when companies like Event and uh, Liefeld Studio, et cetera, under the tutelage of that particular leader for Marvel, I was actually offered and entertained the possibility of being the publisher of Marvel Comics. So I was actually wow. wined and dined. This is true. I was actually wined and dined. I was brought out to uh, Marvel. I was set up. And I think we vaguely, both sides explored the possibility, but I knew, I knew I wasn't a fit. It's not, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm a fan, but I, I wouldn't work in that corporate environment that well. And I let them know that preemptively. I thought, uh, I'm not going to name names, but there are people behind the scenes really advocating that I should publish for them. And there are people who are actually total players to this day, but, um, I knew that I would feel trapped. And I, I wasn't a fit for them. They didn't, they didn't know it yet, but I knew I wouldn't be a fit. Constricting. Let's explore yes. that if you don't mind. Um, sure. Because I imagine there are certain things that you can get away with in, when, when making comics and things you can't. And as it pertains to censorship, I'm curious, what's been your experience in this industry? We have a peculiar industry because we all make a thing called comic books. And it's a strange name for what we do. Because frequently there isn't anything funny about them. And I'm not speaking just for myself. I'm saying even superheroic fiction, et cetera. I think things like the graphic novel, it's a shame that just globally we hadn't picked up on using that word. So I think when people think of the word comic and book, it conjures up imagery of material for children. And I think this totally sticks to this day. The general public who is who are not as involved as we are, whether it be as like fans or professionals, they really think the default mechanism is that comic books are for children. Even the superheroic fiction that dominates cinema right now, I mean, that could be enjoyed by everybody, and, and I enjoy it as much as the next guy, but I think it calls to the notion of mass market and for children. So that being the baseline, anything that tends to deviate from that seems to get a reaction. So in my particular case, I mean, as recently as 10 days ago, we produced a book called Hell Witch the Forsaken, and we were at pre-press with a printing partner of ours. And they came along to a certain page, page 22. And it was a, um, what I would call a carefully gloved sexual depiction. And I don't think it was X-rated or hardcore. However, the printer looked at it and said, look, we can't print this unless you alter it. Wow. And that was because one of their employees objected to the work. These guys have been our printing partner for a while. And, you know, they were happy to produce all the stuff that we do that has a lot of violence in it and cursing, but it was that depiction of uh, sexual activity that got them. So interesting. it is interesting. And now here's the challenge in all this, the way I view free market capitalism, I declined to alter the material and chose to take my business elsewhere. And I didn't really vilify them because strangely, I don't like to be censored, but by the same token, I completely understand their right to not want to print that material. If their one employee in a company of 250 would object we live in a weird culture where maybe they would get sued for otherwise producing this piece of material that some people consider objective we actually we recovered we are printing somewhere else and it is a challenge though so like on the one hand we're proud like we're doing something that got banned to this day and right. we have a history of doing that i mean tom in the 90s we were doing a trading card set that portrayed uh, lucifer the fictional character that represents the devil and we had printers that wouldn't touch it just because of that particular depiction so we're talking about upending a multi, literally a multi-million dollar non-sport trading card project to another printer because of, because of a singular depiction of Lucifer. Wow. I can't imagine the amount of stress that goes into those types of business conversations when you're, you're ready to take a product line to the community, especially this recent one. We're talking about this recent Kickstarter. We were just talking about this a week ago. Yeah, we're here in November. We're talking like mid-November. Wow. Yeah, it just occurred. So this, is, this is, is literally happening right now still in major publishing companies. Well, it is. I mean, it's a challenge. Again, um, you know, we have our particular view, which is part of the freedom of being who we are. Coffin Comics is we're going to produce our content and we can't bow. Sure. And by the way, I would say, I would assert that this phenomenon is acute in here in the United States. We could do violence and cursing all day, but depictions of sexuality get challenging here domestically. 
but we could go to printing partners in Canada and actually in Asia, totally normal. And it's less sensitive for people. Oh, it's wow. just so simply it's less sensitive. Specifically here in the States, there's that's just been, a little bit more. That's only, that's been my experience. So okay. that's just this particular view. I can't speak to other people's, but that that's been ours. And for those who don't know, you've been producing mature comic books for over 25 years and yes. one of the leading independent publishers of comic books since the early 90s. So if you're experiencing it, then I'm, I'm sure this smaller press has experienced it as well. I, I would imagine so. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in fact, when we, you know, we're kind of promoting that we got banned and we're kind of, for a moment, we're all happy about it. And then we realize, okay, this is okay. Back to one. Was there we a moment? Was there even a moment in any of these times where you thought, oh, well, we'll just, uh, take that page to Photoshop and, and blur this just a little bit. No, not, not yeah, one moment. Can't do it, man. Yeah. I can't appreciate because, that. uh, it's interesting because, you know, it'd be much easier to do that. We could have even like the page has three panels on it, maybe make one panel bigger and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I guess I would be a sellout for what I do if I did it. So, and you know, it was neat. I was actually on the phone with my representative and, they said, you know, we're doing, we're taking a look at the material and we have found something that we consider objectionable on page 22. And if you would just blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I won't name a name, but I'll just say, Johnny, I'm going to have to ask you to uh, stop speaking right now. And if what you're saying is you are recommending that I change my material to suit your needs, I can't do that. So I understand that we'll just have to agree to disagree on that and we're going to move on. So before I was able to really edify that. I have to talk to our president, uh, Francisco Polito. I would just say, okay, look, you know what we're getting into by doing this because now we're back to one. We we're almost at, we were literally going to the press. So we actually had a, we agreed company wide and back to one. Okay. Let's go find a printing partner and then make sure they don't object to this particular piece, which I would assert would be nothing crazier than you would see on the FX channel. Nothing that crazy. It's, right. uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the question of cursing and sexuality and mature reader content comic books you know i really look at the landscape and i'm just looking at how people pose on instagram i'm looking at cable content and it's nothing that we do you don't see there to be honest with you mm -hmm. it's yeah just... and lady death isn't x-rated it's 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 tastefully done and, and thanks has been for well, for decades well the fascinating thing thank you for that time and i think the fascinating thing about lady death is somehow somewhere along the line people decided it was mature and I actually never thought we were all that mature, but given that we were having that uh, label anyway, we were like, that's where we're going. All sure. right, so more cursing, more sex, more violence. Let's have it, honestly. Sure. And then knowing, again, the landscape, I watched Game of Thrones, and I'm like, what What didn't happen on Game of Thrones? You know, incest, sex, violence, beheading, you know, rape. It's crazy. So uh, I don't even know that we go that far, but given the pop cultural landscape, but what I would say to you, you said, is there a moment where you're kind of thinking, maybe make the change? I think once... We accepted our answer and we're moving on to the next printer. Somewhere in there, I totally intellectually realized, you know, you just made it harder on yourself, Polito. But this has always been the answer. The answer is always no. I love it. Well, do you think that in this uh, type of environment with with censorship in general, that it would be difficult to cause these ripples as you described back in 1998, like the goal of getting new individuals into comic books. You know, that's always our goal to this day. And I, I mean, we could see it now empirically through crowdfunding. We can see when we attract people who have never crowdfunded a comic book before. Okay. So it's still always the goal. Uh, so uh, I do think that we, in the, in the domain of comic book entertainment, we're competing with everything that's happening. So our type of entertainment competes with everyone's, whatever they're doing in their day, other forms of entertainment. I think sometimes people get a little short-sighted thinking that comic book companies compete with each other. I mean, certainly they do for market share, but our competition is for people's attention, whether that is for the other types of entertainment they consume or just the stuff that's in their life every day, the ups and the downs, the changes. So that the premise of going out there and looking for the ripple, going to cause the ripple, it's it's kind of what we wake up and go after every day. It, But it's sort of like the carrot that's on the stick. It's always a little further out. I'll close with this, Brian. Back in the early 90s, you caused a ripple with Lady Death and in introducing this sword wielding badass who fights evil mm -hmm. in hell and earth. And yes. when you started taking Lady Death back to press a little bit more recently, right? In the last five years, is that correct? February 4th will be our fifth anniversary of launching a new Lady Death story. All of those stories from the 90s, retcon now, 
this new Lady Death line of comic books over those last five years. Fresh stories, fresh take. Now for the first time on Indiegogo available for everyone to jump into, is it not? Yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely. In fact, yeah, it's the 10 chapters of Lady Death, and we usually have them in what's called a square bound, perfect bound format of at least 48 pages, all the way up to 64. But yeah, in the last five years, we've had 10 chapters of Lady Death, and right now they're all available on Indiegogo under Lady Death, the collection. I thought this would just be a great time to bring the Indiegogo to the community because we've had you on a few times on the show. And I want to have all of the individuals who are interested in jumping on one of the challenges in getting into comics sometimes is people don't know where to start. Yeah. And this is an easy place to start. I'm personally going with the hardcover. I'm going to get the one through three trade. I have the one through three, but I don't have them in a hardcover bound. So I'm going to pick that perk up and I recommend the community do so as well. We're going to put the link in the bio um, and introduce Lady Deaths to the combo community who haven't, Thank you. who haven't met her yet. And her badass. You need to meet her. You don't need to, but I cordially invite you to meet her. Oh, you, I'll say you, you need to. You. I'll, I'll say <laughs> you need to. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Brian, until next time. I've been Brian Polito, geek responsibly, and comic Tom, assemble. <laughs> <laughs> assemble. I love it. Brian, you're awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll see you again soon. All right. Let's talk about Sir Kate's this week. This guy caused a ruckus. We're, we're, we're filming this during Thanksgiving week, and I hope everyone had a really good holiday. Donny Cates got into it with a handful of his Twitter followers, some who wanted to just voice their opinions on pirated comic books. Comic books that I didn't pay for, but they were able to find online because some people post them on the internet and you can find them. Now, the definition of pirate, pirated comic books, it's pretty clear cut. You know, if you download the comic, it's a PDF, you know, it's stealing. You got to pay for these things. There's comiXology. There's always that as an option. However, the ways in which you can consume comics are so different. You know, they're all over the place. You can do, you know, we do breakdown videos and we show pages as we talk about them and, and provide context. I mean, you have Comic Storian who does literal page by page breakdowns. And you see almost the whole book. So the extent of which how you can consume comic books, there's a gamut. But on one end, which is the illegal end, it's pirated comics, and it's like just the straight, strict download. And this is what Donny Cates has to say about that. And this is in response to someone saying, I don't have access to the comic books, or I can't afford it. He says, sorry, if you don't have money, you don't get to just steal from artists and justify it. I want a lot of things I can't afford. I either save for it or I don't get it. You aren't going to make me feel bad for condoning people literally stealing from me and my friends. So I want to chat about this. I think that it's an important subject. It's right around Thanksgiving. And I want to hear your thoughts about it, Bueller. Well, first off, both you and I know Donnie. We both met him. We both talked to him before. I'm not surprised that Donnie kind of took exception to this and he went on Twitter to let his voice be heard. Now, I got to tell you, the comic book market is a very small market. And it's a type of market that can't afford to have piracy going on in it. It's just too small. Other markets, you can do it. Other markets like, say, DVDs or movies or television or music, it's such a big market, it can't afford a little bit of piracy. It's not the right thing to do, but the market will survive. Piracy in comic books can kill the market for comics. That's right. We're talking about some low print count comic books that if they don't hit a certain milestone, the, the stories get canceled. So even if a small 5, 10, 20,000 happen to read a comic book online illegally and not go to the shelf, even if 50% of them had, it may be the differential of whether a comic stays on the shelf. That is the difference. It really is. It's just a few hundred or a thousand sold copies makes a difference between a title going away. And there's some great titles that do go away because they don't have enough readers we need to make sure that we are going to our comic shop that we are buying our comics this is the media that has lasted longer than cds than dvds and it's the easiest to pirate but yet it's still a tradition on wednesday to go get your comic books and you need to do it that's why donnie took exception to this and he doesn't want people pirating his books donnie did this during thanksgiving week and i have a concern that this timing wasn't great and that this may actually hurt the cause first off what's your gut response to that i thought the timing was right on 
He okay. did the right thing, man. This, this is exactly what this guy does. He's in the face. He is the face of comics for Marvel right now, and he's going to let it be known what he wants to say. It doesn't matter the timing, in my opinion, and I think it would be great as this conversation is the conversation that people are having on Thanksgiving at the dinner table. That's a dream come true. Although I agree with you, Bueller, I think the timing is fine. Many in the community did not agree with it, and they thought it was poor timing. And I don't know. I want to hear from the community what you think about this in the comment section below, because I think it's important to bring up these conversations and to, to have these topics discussed fully, because the more people know, the more they're going to do the right thing. However, I want it to be effective. I want people to actually do what they're supposed to do. I want there to be more comics made. I want people to read comics. That's the big thing. And you said something here that was important, Bueller. You said that there is like a joy to this community that's kept it alive. We're talking about a printed form, one that survived the digital age. It doesn't even make sense that these things could be purchased at stores still, but it does because there is a joy to comic collecting that only the collectors and members of their LCS and this community hit the subscribe button. They get this benefit from actually having these comics in hand. And I think that if anything, when we're talking about pirated comic books and whether or not you know it's okay or not okay, or whether if you have money and you can't afford it, and it's kind of like, you know, do you steal the bread to feed your family type of conversation? Like you can get caught up in, in those semantics all day long. Bottom line, people are gonna pirate comics. They're gonna do it. It's gonna happen. But I think the bigger conversation is communicating the value of actually engaging in the community and spending money and going into shops and buying your comics and having them in hand and the joy that you just described, Bueller, putting that to the forefront will make it so that our publishers and those pirate numbers mean nothing to these creators because the potential of getting people into this community is so much grander than these numbers that these websites stack because someone wants to be caught up on the latest issue of Venom and they didn't hit their LCS in time. There's a passion to comic books that's different than a lot of other collecting. There is a passion to holding your books and reading your books type thing. I've been emotionally connected to a book I have read. I have never been emotionally connected to a CD or a DVD before. And those are the most pirated forms of media today. It's a different area. And it's so nice to see that People do get passionate about this. It's important to people. That's why it gets bring up and that's why we need to talk about it. I love it. You know what else I really enjoy to talk about, Bueller? Is viewer comments. And that's why we always encourage our community to comment down below because you never know who's going to be on the mic. We may source comments from any videos. And Bueller, you'll be on the show again in the future. So make sure to comment down in today's video for anything to Bueller too, because we'll be sourcing comments from this video eventually as well. But let's take a look at a comment from last week's video. This is from Opus Garza. He says, I always find it funny that every time Tom brings up the first appearance of Wolverine, the controversy, Ryan transforms into a sleepy time Ryan. His eyes get heavy. His speech slows down a little. And you hear a lot more of his half-word outbursts, LOL. More Wolverine content, Tom. Keep it coming. Opus knows what he's talking about. You can never have enough content about Wolverine. The conversation about his first appearance will go on forever. It's been going on forever, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. The fact that Ryan gets so upset about it, <laughs> and he looks like he just got off the bus, and it just looks horrible. It is funny. I know exactly what he's talking about. I love bringing it up to him, Bueller. It's the funniest thing. Whenever I tell him, you know, we got some more like real first appearances to discuss, it's because there's so much pressure, Bueller. You know, we're going through, we want to be super accurate in the comic books that we discuss. People pay a lot of money for these things. And there's polarizing subjects here, you know, where the communities get split and, you know, we're here just delivering information we think is interesting, but the pressure is real and it could be a little exhausting because we spend a lot of time going through pages of comics to confirm these appearances. You know, what comic is it in this run? Let's go through the whole run and figure it out. And it gets tiring, man, but we put in the work for the comic book community. Let's take a look at this uh, next comment. Bueller, you spotted this one and wanted to discuss it. Sure. So the next comment we have is from Mr. Fries9983. He says, question, Chris Claremont is coming to my LCS for free comic book day and is signing one book for free for everyone. Any suggestions on a minor affordable key that will benefit from his signature? Ooh, I really enjoyed that question. Now, 
the first thing I want to know, Bueller, is what comic book would you suggest? And then I also want to know why you picked this question. Well, I got to say the book I'm going to pick on this one is going to be Wolverine number one by Chris Claremont. It's one of my favorite books in my collection. And not only that, it's signed also by Chris Claremont. And you know what? This is an affordable book. I mean, this goes for under $100, and it's a classic one. It's got a great cover. Tom, have you read this one before? Of course I've read it, man. It's a four-issue miniseries. Frank Miller bringing the heat. I mean, it's a classic run. Everybody needs it in their collection and needs to read it. And you know what? If you get that Chris Claremont signature, it's going to be needing that Miller signature next. So maybe a good one to grab. Yeah, Tom, this one is a classic. And I got to tell you, the reason I picked it is because this is the book I got signed at that Comic-Con that we went to. It's the one that where we hosted the panel for Chris Claremont. Oh, he signed this for me, and we're going to talk about it at the end of the show. Yeah, Bueller convinced me to talk about one of the most embarrassing moments that I've had when doing the Comic Tom show. We hosted a panel with Chris Claremont, did the interview on stage in front of 70 plus people and made a fool out of ourselves. But we're going to save it for the after show. You know, once the camera shut off, the mics keep going on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. I just want to also mention if he's doing a free signature, which is unusual, isn't it? I mean, from the last like four times I've seen Chris, he's charged for signatures. We did his panel and I had to pay $10 for him to sign this book. <laughs> he charged you? <laughs> yeah, he charged me 10 bucks <laughs> okay. after we did his panel. The following Emerald City that we did, I actually had him sign something for me and I had him sign my triple cover of X-Men 136. And what's fun is that I had asked him, I had to pay like an extra 10 bucks, but he did a word bubble. This wasn't in the first draft, which is true. And you know what? I would recommend that if you are getting a free signature already and you want to get something that is a little bit more unique. I mean, Chris Claremont signatures are out there. You can pretty much buy any comic book with a Chris Claremont signature. He's been doing it for freaking decades. He wrote so much X-Men. You may find yourself happier with something more unique and personalized, kind of like the one that I got here. So let's move on to the next comment. This is from Nicoli Tembungi4 says ads are really part of the comic book it fills the remaining pages of the book so this is in reference to key appearances in comics because of the advertisements i'm, I'm curious to know bueller what are your thoughts on key appearances because of advertisements placed in non-key books so you're telling me that the advertisement that features the character should be considered possibly a first appearance or a key appearance of sorts I don't think it is. I think ads are just what they are. They're just ads. Even though they're in the book, I don't consider that as a first appearance or a key. I know that there are collectors out there that look for those, but honestly, I don't think the value of those books will mirror the value of the real first appearance books that we're talking about. Like say the first appearance of yet Wolverine. Sorry, Ryan, we're talking about it again. But you know what? That's going to hold its value. The advertisement for Wolverine's first appearance isn't going to hold the value that the number one does. I can see your point there. And you know what? I would largely agree with that. But then this past week, something really interesting happened. I'm going on eBay. I'm looking over past listings because I have a handful of things saved that I'm trying to track. And we had something hit the market. It came and went quick. It sold for a staggering amount. And I'm talking about Batman almost got him. So yeah, I actually heard about this on your show. It's the Batman Almost Got Him. It's that mini comic with the cassette. Apparently, this predates the first appearance of Harley Quinn. That's right. Coming out that same year, at least that's what the folklore is. This is a real first appearance. It wasn't sold at comic shops. This was sold at like a, like a Fred Meyer or a Target type of store. And yes, it came with a cassette tape because it was like a read-along comic book. And it was miniature, but it showcases the comic adaptation of the first appearance of Harley Quinn in Batman Adventures, the series. It's been creeping up in value over the years. We saw this start to spike this past year when more collectors learned about it, but we just saw a recent 9.8 exceed $2,000. That is more than a Batman Adventures 12. It is more, but honestly, Tom, I look at something like that and it really appeals to like the hardcore collector type thing to where the other Batman adventures book, that's going to appeal to a lot broader audience. So if you're not like the hardcore fan that just has to have everything, I don't think it sparks the interest that the regular comics have. 
Yeah, it's really dependent of that collector, and I just find it interesting to to see the trends and how some collectors feel different over others. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's uh, these prices are are seeing records across the board, aren't they? Not they are. It's it's surprising how much they go for. But man, people love Harley Quinn. Thanks to Cultra Geek PR, you won the DHP special, the first appearance of Sin City from last week's podcast. We also have another winner. We have Ruben Guzman. He is the winner of the Undiscovered Country exclusive cover that's only available in the Mystery Mail Call brought to you by none other than Comic Con 101. Congratulations, my friend. You can add it to your collection. That's right. Our mystery mail call. The link is in the bio to join the community. We are currently taking enrollment for December. We send out a box of comic books to your door every single month. And in every single box that everyone gets, there is a Comic Tom exclusive. And this month's exclusive is courtesy of Scout Comics. It's a homage to some Mariner issue number five, the first appearance of Tiger Shark. We have Metal Shark Bro Bueller. Can you please just enlighten the community? on what Metal Shark Bro is about. So, first off, I love Scout Comics, but uh, Metal Shark is about, it's the uh, a tale as old as time. The shark eats a Satan worshiper, and the shark, <laughs> it's hard to explain, but the shark then becomes somewhat human, but all the shark wants to do is become a shark, and uh, that's what the book's about, right? Yeah, it's Metal Shark, bro. If you like stoner comedy, if you like like metal and you like sharks, you're going to enjoy this Comic Tom exclusive. And we also had Nick from Key Collector break some information on the top 10. He surprised me, but he had word that, I guess, Cartoon Network is looking at this property. No guarantees yet. Wasn't worthy of a key alert. You know, nothing says solidified, but I thought that this was just a really cool comic book. Didn't know there was any news on it until recently. So you may want to secure your copy for that reason, but if not, the story alone is worth getting your copy. It sounds good. I mean, come on. It's You have to have an original imagination to come up with that, and that's exactly what this book is. We need to talk about Todd McFarlane again. There are more comic books that he has gone on record that he said he refuses to sign. He's just not going to do it, Bueller. Tom, I think he watched one of your videos, and I think that's why he made this video on his Facebook. He saw you talking about this, and that's why he made this video. That's my theory. Well, basically, this is what's going on. The CGC saw our video that the guru and I made about the Todd McFarlane CGC private signing. They liked it so much, they reached out. They actually want to have a greater show up on the show at some point. Again, we've actually had Matt Nelson join our show before and, and enlighten the community on the inner workings of CGC in the past. But they reached out. They really liked the video. And then they reposted it. And they reposted it on their Facebook and their Instagram. It was really cool. But then something even cooler happened. Todd McFarlane went on Facebook and did a live video talking about the subject just like the next day. So Bueller, I think you're right. I think he saw the video, whether it was with CGC's help or not, but he took out comic books on camera and said, hey, let's just talk about comics that I'm not going to sign at this next signing. And I'm going to surprise the community. This is kind of about, about comics that Todd won't sign again, but it's also not in the video he showed a bunch of books he showed a bunch of books that he would sign like the spawn books the spawn 300 the 301 the record breaker and some of the other books as well his spider-man books he's pretty much focused on the characters he created or if he had something to do with the book himself but the ones that were really interesting were the ones that he wouldn't sign and the ones that are in his collection and that's what we're going to talk about that's right. Todd had examples of books that he wouldn't sign. He said if he didn't have anything to do with the book and that the book didn't have a character that he created, well, he's not going to sign it. He's going to refuse it. But then he took out parts of his personal collection. And that's what this this part of the podcast is about, <laughs> is we have straight up shots of Todd McFarlane's grails. And we're going to go through them. And I also reached out to the guru and had him price them because we have close up of the CGC labels. So let's jump into it. The first book that he pulls out is the first appearance of Spider-Man. It's awesome. Amazing Fantasy number 15. This is an 8.0 restored. There is some work done on this book. We have some color touches. We have pieces added. The cover is trimmed. We also have some white off-white pages, which isn't bad. The staples were cleaned. How much is this thing worth, Tom? All right. We have a, you know, again, these are conservative estimates. You know, the 
the guru made sure to mention that some of these books are actually down a little bit, but he said he wouldn't be surprised for this book to hit between 30 and $35,000 in this condition. It's a lot of restoration on this book, but I was so stoked because he didn't just show these books like, like this. There was a close-up shot so we can actually read the numbers and actually see what problems are on this comic book. Cause I'm like, I'm curious. I want to know what the grails are that Todd McFarlane owns and what their value is. It's stuff's fascinating to me. Let's chat about the next book that he won't sign. It's a Kirby classic. It is. It's Fantastic Four number one, 7.0 also restored this book came out the same year tom mcfarlane was born i thought that was pretty cool obviously he didn't have anything to do with it and then that's why he's not going to sign this book but this book has white pages and also a little bit of color touch but really that's it and it's a beautiful book that's right and i reached out to the guru he said this is between an eight and ten thousand dollar book in this market it's a good one to be holding on to i'm curious if these books bueller were maybe bought together because we're seeing so much restoration happen apparently he is more interested in the appeal and how the book looks from afar than whether or not the pages themselves are all authentic not to mention todd is a collector of many things he was really big in the baseball he was famous for buying the home run baseball world breaker for like over a million dollars so i'm not surprised that he has these in his collection the next one that he showcased on his facebook i have to imagine he had to visit his bank vault or he must have a vault in house because this isn't one of those thirty thousand dollar books or one of the small ten thousand dollar books like ff1 is right no he breaks out the grail of all grails he breaks out an action number one action comics one first appearance of superman 7.0 the first superhero restored but holy smokes talk about restoration huh yeah there is some restoration on this book you know but i don't blame him one bit i mean look at this book it's action comics number one it's the main book it's the grail of grails a little bit of color touch up a little bit of pieces added the seals were clean the staples replaced edges trimmed you know what i would do the same thing but more than likely i would never have this book but if anyone's watching they got an extra one feel free to send it my way yeah, there you go, Bueller. You never know. Maybe someone will be very generous. But you know what? <laughs> I reached out to the guru and read him the label, like the list of restored things that were on the book. Do you know what he said? No, I don't know what he said. He said, what an abomination. <laughs> 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 but, then he's, but then I laughed and I'm like, all right, but for real though, what do you expect this to hit the market? And he said, oh, that's an easy $250,000 for sure. So there you go, Todd. We just give you an approximate estimate value of your three major grails. I think it's awesome that he hit the internet here. He's serving the collector's community here. And by going on the video to share some of his personal collection and, you know, just provide a little bit more background on his reasoning and what he wants to sign and not sign. I think it's just more engagement with his community. And that right there are some of the biggest moves in the comic book community to actually grow it. You know what I mean? I do. And honestly, I got to tell you, it was so great to see part of his collection. And I want like the comic book community, the people watching this video, share with us what's your grail in your collection. I know what mine is. I'd love to hear what yours are. Yeah. What's your grail right now, Bueller? Mine's the Hulk 181, the first appearance of Wolverine. <laughs> there you go. You heard it from Bueller. Okay. Now let's uh, move on to the next subject here. We got... This is like one of my favorite subjects. I've been waiting to get to this one for quite some time. And we have some fun ones, some that I didn't even know. But we have some comic books to discuss. We're talking about recalled comic books. These are comic books that were so controversial for various reasons that the publisher said, no, stop them, pulp them, get rid of them, destroy them. Let's get into it. Absolutely. The first one we have is right off the bat. It's Spider-Man Reign, number one. Now you're thinking to yourself, Spider-Man recalled comics what could that be well this comic could have actually been in one of our other categories this was recalled because of nudity in this comic book there is an old aged peter parker and he is fully nude sitting on a bench and you can see i'm gonna say it you can see spidey's genitalia right there on full display yeah peter showing his peter and you know what the publishers <laughs> were not happy about this it was missed by editors and they immediately went to reprint it adding a shadow and trying to cover it up but here's the thing this is a comic book run it's a four issue miniseries i believe and it's fantastic 
it is yeah. a story that I recommend for a lot of people because for one, it's a little bit more mature because it's dark. We have kind of a harsh future where Peter accidentally kills Mary Jane post coitus because his, as they say in the comics, his radioactive fluids caused her cancer. Now, although that may seem a little ridiculous and is actually kind of revered as just a fantastic Spider-Man story, but it is overshadowed by some of these controversial themes and specifically that panel the editor missed. Yeah, and honestly, this book is widely available. Even though it was a recalled book, there was many of this book out there to be bought. In, and it's actually only selling for around $6. That's not a lot to get a recalled book from a few years back. An affordable comic book that has a little bit more of a story than just the good narrative in the pages, but one that is kind of uplifted in the community because it's controversial aspects. Let's also discuss one that, although didn't get recalled, it kind of falls in line with the Spider-Man Rain comic book because of nudity overshadowing the content and how good it actually was. And I have a feeling that had this not been as popular, Bueller, it would have been recalled. Yeah, I think so. This is the Batman Dam number one is what we're talking about. And there was nudity in this one as well. Just like in the Spider-Man book, we actually get to see Bruce Wayne's genitalia in this one also. And the interesting thing about this book the preview copy of this book came out. It did not have it in there. But the retail copy, when it hit the shelves, had that in the book. It spread like wildfire. There was people buying this book in dozens. And you know what? Before they could even get the recall out, they were all gone. They were literally all gone. And they didn't bother doing a second print. They just waited and went on to issue number two. So the next book that we have to discuss is Legendary. I cannot tell you how many copies of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen issue number five I have flipped through just to see if the Marvel douche ad was inside. That's right. Have you had any luck finding it? I've never found one. Rumor <laughs> is, is that they were all destroyed prior to hitting the American shelves, but some DC packs are said to have them contained and a batch of shipment went overseas to the UK and has been confirmed to reach the public. These comics are out there. But what are we talking about? There is an ad for a hygiene product. It's, it's an ad that was placed in the back of the book. And then when the editor, Paul Levitz, found the ad, he was concerned of potential litigation. So he decided to put a recall notice and then re-release the comic book with the word Marvel changed to amaze. Right now we're talking about the douche thing, which is a little different. But there's actually books out there right now that they're taking action against. Like Tommy Gun Wizards was one that they had to change the title because Tommy Gun is copyrighted. And the latest issue of that came out, it just said Wizards. So this is a normal practice, and I'm glad that they caught that. And he caught it before he could get sued by Marvel. <laughs> Nobody wants that to happen. This book, like you said, is hard to find, but I did find one on CGC that was sold. It was a 9.2 and it sold for over $260. And something that I find just hilarious is that Alan Moore was published four months after this comic book hit the newsstands and he had inserted in the art of this top 10 publication a character reading a newspaper and the headline of the newspaper was miracle douche recall this is something that didn't just cause a stir among the publishers this caused a stir among the creators as well you gotta watch what you put in a comic book you also have to watch what you put in the microwave do you not you always have to watch what you put in the microwave because when you turn your back you never know what type of baby is going to crawl inside of a microwave because that happened in Elseworlds 80 page giant that got recalled. There was a babysitter. It was Clark Kent. If I'm not mistaken, the baby Clark Kent, right? Yep, that's right. And the baby actually crawled into the microwave and it got zapped was recalled because apparently this might've actually took place in reality. Recalled for not just the baby in the microwave scene, but you know what? It also shows like the other problems of dealing with the super infant, like the infant getting tied to the ceiling fan and spinning around in circles, or even the infant getting a hold of some electric cables and just nomming on them. You know, 
it was controversial. They didn't want to risk anything. But something that I found funny is that this story would actually go on to be revered and get awards because of how good it was. Yeah, and you know what? I looked it up, Tom, and there's actually sold copies of this raw book that have been sold for $256. Can you tell us about Weird Trips number two? This is a comic book that came out in 1978. Recalled Comics has been happening since the 70s. This was recalled because of the cover. It has Ed Gain on the cover, who is a serial killer, and he is actually eating people on the cover. He's got like a stew. He's using their bones as a spoon. And it's disturbing. And like you said, this book came out in 1978. So quite a long time ago. I didn't know about this. When you pointed it out, I was surprised. But I could see definitely why it would be recalled. Written by Greg Depsey and drawn by Bill Stout. This $50 comic book is amazing that it ever hit the stands at all because of how grotesque the cover is. It was only a dollar back then. But you know what? It told the tale of what inspired the films of Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's crazy this thing was produced. Normal books would cover this right away, but to see this in a comic book form and so close to that action that actually took place, it is surprising. So this next book that we have on the list, and honestly, this is one of my favorites, and this is going to be a great discussion. We have Swamp Thing number 11. This is a new 52 title, and the story behind this book is awesome. We have a bunch of quotes that we're going to mention, but honestly, you got to see this to believe this. That's right. We're talking about Marco Rudy. He was drawing Arcane. This is in Swamp Thing issue number 11. And Arcane is a tentacle type of creature, and he's emerging from beneath the swamp, and he's taking on Swamp Thing, and they're getting into a fight. And this story is so funny that we just got to read you some of these quotes here. So basically, Scott Snyder, the writer of this comic book, was sitting on panel at Heroes Con in Charlotte. And this is in 2012. He gets a text message from the editor at the time, Matt Idelson. And what does Matt tell Scott? He says he has to pulp the comics. He has to actually get rid of every one of them. Scott says, Matt, why? Why do we have to get rid of all of them? So this is actually the quote from Matt. So one of Arcane's tentacles looks a little dickish. He looks a little dickish and Scott's like, what? What are you talking about? So Scott says, yo, you need to send me these panels. So he's getting these panels. Can you imagine? Like he's on a panel and he's getting panels. It's Inception style. And he goes, okay, he, I kind of see it. He's going through the page and he's, and he's like, okay, I guess I can see they're kind of phallic shaped. But still, you got to pulp the issues, like all of them. And then Matt's like, no, 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 Scott, no, look at panel four. And, and Scott, he looked at panel four, and I think he had your response, Bueller. So my response is, uh, yeah, you need to get rid of these books. <laughs> so this is hilarious because Scott Snyder would go on to admit that this whole debacle was his fault from the get-go because he was reminded that he told Marco, the artist, specifically, this is the quote, for more tentacles, if possible, in panel one and panel four. So in a way... He had created the penis tentacle that had ruined my own book. Scott did it to himself. That's awesome. And Tom, you say that a lot better than I do. But if you look at panel number one, I could see where that would be kind of brushed by. Maybe every now and then you might be, oh, well, something's going on there. But panel four is clearly, how does that get past press? Uh, that's crazy. It's crazy, man. But it's comics like these that just make me chuckle. And, you know, it's recalled stories like this that give them just a another reason to enjoy them because it brings up conversation. It's a little bit of comic history. And holy smokes, like how, how funny are some of these things? Because the creators, they get involved in the conversation, and that's what makes them real special. I encourage the community to check out the controversial comics category section on Key Collector. There are a bunch of comic books books that are controversial for the reasons why we discussed, but a plethora of other ones. And you got to know them because these are actually available on the hunt because a lot of these, there's little minute details that make them controversial. And if you know what they are, you know what to look for when you are presented the opportunity to get them possibly on the cheap. That's right. And I always use the key collector app. It's got the section for these books right there. And it tells you what to look for because a lot of these recalled books, they were replaced with other books. Now you know exactly what to look for if you have the Key Collector app. 
That's right. Use code TOM101 to unlock a free week subscription to unlock the full service of the app. I'm confident you're going to find one comic book that's going to end up paying for the service in its entirety. Hey, Tom, I had a blast. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. It was a pleasure, my friend. You know, if you're not familiar with me, like I said, I'm Bueller from Comics with Bueller. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me in the description down below. And you can also find me as a featured channel on Comic-Con's homepage as well. That's right. You're actually the first YouTube channel I featured on the main YouTube homepage. And I really appreciate you, Bueller, our friendship and the comic book community. We're going to continue this conversation with some fun stories about a, a very embarrassing Chris Claremont interview that we did here on our audio platforms. I hope you join us. Don't forget to comment down below. Let us know what you thought about this video and it'll enter you to win one of two copies of Shows End, the Comic Tom exclusive that we're going to be announcing on next week's podcast. Remind you, we're going to be continuing this conversation on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. And we will see you next week. Thanks, comic fam. As always. Geek responsibly. Enough said. <laughs>